for those of you that uh, believe me be long-winded, well, perhaps if you were in the service last week, you, you have that impression. But uh, I will say with Carol's friend Dina, she wanted a very casual service. There were only uh, seven of us there. Um, she did ask that it be kept under 10 minutes. Actually got the whole wedding ceremony in with multiple prayers um, in less than nine minutes. Put that out there. <laughs> One of my gifts. Uh, as we speak of gifts, we bring our gifts before the Lord. We bring who we are. Yeah, and that, that's a gift. God has gifted our personalities to us. He's gifted us with, with natural talents and abilities. And uh, when we come into the faith, he blesses us with spiritual gifts. And that's what we're called to use for him. We're called to use who we are, and so we bring our gifts. And for some of us, it is talking. Uh, for some, it's listening. It's being available. It's offering hospitality. It's being organized and, and coordinating. And some are kind of in the spotlight, and some are behind the scenes. And, and some are kind of, some of the gifts we bring are kind of big moments, and some of them are those gentle, simple moments day after day, year after year. And this is who we are, and this is what we give to the Lord. We give from all of ourselves. We, we often get this kind of mistaken notion that because the offering uh, has typically involved, you know, um, an offering plate or a basket uh, or a, a bag on the end of a stick being shared in the pews and you put something in it, we often kind of get this idea of our offering being the financial gifting. And that's, that's a part of it. But the bigger part is offering ourselves, saying, here my Lord, send me. Even if it's just into the living room, send me. We offer now, these are gifts before the Lord. Holy God, receive these gifts. Recognize that we are indeed cheerful givers, understanding who you have been and who you continue to be. We recognize how you have blessed us and how you have used others to be part of that blessing. And now, Lord, we ask that you use us to bless others. That we can share your name, your light, your peace, your joy, your comfort. That we can be part of the message. That we can be the hands and the feet, the lips, the hearts of your gospel as we share the good news of Jesus Christ and the many ways in which you have gifted us to do so. Receive now, Father, these are gifts. Bless these gifts. Use them according to your will, in your way, and in your time. These gifts we bring in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn... Standing on the Promises. If you're using a hymnal at home, it's hymn number 687. Uh, it is included in the worship packet. Um, and I, I, the more I've used these worship packets, the more I appreciate the larger print. I try to get things as big as I can, and I'm, I'm appreciating that more and more. Um, and so it's a two-page uh, the, you'll, you'll see that the, the chorus is partly on a second page, so you might need to kind of open it booklet style. Um, but if that's a bit much or it's hard to see, there's a lyrics only uh, on, the, on the next page. Um, and I know that many of you know the tune already and you know the chorus, but sometimes it's those, that third and fourth verse that um, we tend to forget. Standing on the promises, and I got to invite you to stand. Uh, we're going to sing Standing on the Promises. And, and you remember your high school chorus teacher that taught you that you stand, you sing better when you're standing up straight, you know. Let's sing together, standing on the promise.
is that God will always be there. Sometimes we've kind of mistaken that to God will always be there, kind of like the cops have that speed trap set up as you come over the hill on the highway. That he's always there waiting to catch us, to get us. But the promise we really have is that God will always be there waiting to catch us, to get us. That he's always there listening ready to come to our defense, to be our security. And because we have that promise, we know that when we pray, it's not just some oh, psychological, therapeutic exercise to identify what we believe our need to be. But it is actually our spirit crying out to God who understands more than we do what our need might be. He promises to be there and to listen. He promises to respond and give us what is best for ourselves. Perhaps not what we think is best for ourselves, but what is best for ourselves. So that's why we pray according to His will, because we know His will is to bless us, to protect us, to secure us. And so part of standing on the promises is coming together in prayer. Praying for things that we might, we might know a name or we might know part of a situation. But he's there. And he hears more than we could even pray. He's there to receive our praise. The recognition of, of what he has done. And he knows the praise even, even in our challenging prayers. He knows the praise that comes with testimony because he's proven himself faithful in the past. We know in this difficult circumstance where we don't see the light, we don't see the hope, we don't, we don't find the peace in this, but there's a praise even in offering to him because it shows that we trust him, that he's proven himself to us, that he has been our rock on which we can stand. And so we bring to today gathered prayers. Some shared uh, here within the sanctuary, some that have been, you know, maybe you received as a text or a phone call or you, you talk to somebody at work or at school and you, you picked up on something and, and you bring that today. We bring those praises for the things that we've uh, experienced and seen or have been relayed to us and they, they remind us of how God continues to touch and bless his people, sometimes in big, bold ways, and sometimes in subtle, simple ways. And we praise him for it. And sometimes we recognize that even when we tried to express that prayer to someone, or they tried to express one to us, the words just couldn't do it justice. And so we pray by our spirit. And we trust, because we know it's happened in the past, we trust that God understands and will give us what is best. Let's go together, bringing these prayers before the Lord. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love for us, your faithfulness to us. Even when we have been unfaithful, even when we in our own arrogant rebellion have done things our way, Sometimes deliberately against what we knew to be your way and sometimes just out of sheer ignorance or we did not care to know what you would have us do. You remained faithful. You continued to be near. You continued to be with us. You knew the pain we were going through. You knew the, the stress that we were under. You knew the things that worried us. And you were 
were just waiting to catch us. We thank you that you have always been faithful. Regardless of our, our unfaithfulness. Because you've proven yourself, we come to you now. And we bring the things that we have shared together. Medical issues and challenges and tests and procedures. Recoveries and therapies. Job situations, school situations. Travel mercies when we're going long distance and, oh, even just returning from church services. We recognize the way that you continue to touch lives and to bring about healing of body, mind, spirit, psyche, soul. That in you we can find rest, recuperation, rehabilitation, renewal. We thank you that we can come to you with one hand holding out our requests, our challenges, our struggles. And on the other hand, we can bring our praise and our joys, and then and some days one hand seems to outweigh the other, but that we can bring it all before you because you love all of us. We can bring addiction. We can bring turmoil. We can, we can bring spiritual doubt. We can bring our good health. We can bring our resolve and our commitment. We bring our praise. And we bring the groaning of our heart. And we recognize how this is just part of who we are and it's day by day and moment by moment and you receive us as we are. You are prayer, and you answer according to your will. We thank you, because we've heard the testimony of how great you have been in the big stuff and the small stuff, how you've been faithful for ages. We trust that you'll be faithful now, and we place our hope in you. Hear now these are our prayers. Amen. We continue our, our short series, if you will, and I, I always, well, I don't like to refer to things as a series. Uh, I, I've become more comfortable with that idea, but I know for a lot of folks it causes you to kind of cringe a little bit, oh, a series. I don't think I hear a series of sermons. I, 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 I'm going to miss one, or I miss something, or, or oh, this means we're going to go on the same thing week after week. And I mean, that's okay. I mean, some of you have been watching the same TV series for years. And you know you've missed an episode or two, but you still come back to it. Some of you are afraid to try a new series when it comes out because you've been burned in the past because the, there was that series you really loved and it went downhill or it ended abruptly. Series kind of makes us a little concerned at times. But there's also something to be said for the idea that, that series allows us a more in-depth examination. Some of the series that you do watch on TV, you watch them because you've gotten to understand the characters. 
and the rhythms and the motivations. You can't get that from a 90 minute movie. Or even if you're a Marvel fan, a two and a half hour movie. And you kind of got hooked on, there's another one coming out that's going to explain a little more of the series, a little more of the, the characters. And so series isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it makes us a little nervous. It makes some folks a little nervous. One of the interesting things about this series, and again, I, I, I shared this, um, currently we're, we're, we're basing it off of the epistle readings out of the lectionary. One of the interesting things about this particular series as we look at 1 Peter is that the lectionary kind of has them out of order. I don't quite understand it, uh, why that is. If you were with us last week, you know we read the end of 1 Peter chapter 2. This week we read the beginning, or just after the very beginning, of 1 Peter chapter 2. I actually tried to look that up and, and figure out why it's out of sequence, and I don't, I don't have a good answer. Um, I don't know if you ever noticed that sometimes that series you watch on TV, the air dates of episodes aren't necessarily the right chronological order, uh, and you'll pick up, wait a minute, wait a minute, where'd that person come from? And two episodes later, that character gets introduced, because somehow they filmed it, and then when it got put together, they got out of order. It's also, it also makes it kind of interesting to see if when they do the reruns, if they switch the episodes. Today we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 uh, and following, and it's a little out of sequence. And I will tell you that when I first started looking at this a few weeks back, I debated, do I switch them around? And I'm like, you know, there's, there's probably a reason they're in that way. So I'm just going to go with it, and here's how it made sense to me. We tend not to read straight through passages anyway. We tend to go to where we have a need. I mean, in our personal kind of devotional, we pick up a piece here and we pick up a piece there. And there's something to be said for getting the string it all together, the right chronology, the right order. But we recognize, recognize that even in Scripture, there's certain episodes that hit us better, stronger, more effectively at different periods in our own experience. So I'm okay that our series is a little bit out of order. And I really like that we're doing this during Easter. Not on Easter Sunday, but during Easter. This reminder of what Easter means and how it applies to our lives, how it impacts who we are. How Easter becomes a, another one of those pivot points in our personal histories that it allows us to create in, in this a new identity. That we start something over because of Easter, because of Jesus. So 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. And I'm going to stop. As you come to him, the living stone. Now it's interesting, the, the, uh, oh, by the way, if you're using the worship packet and you see things that are, are underlined or italics or bold, typically that's kind of my editorializing on the scripture. It's my way of drawing attention to certain things. Um, and sometimes you'll notice that, and it, and it varies week to week which style I use, but sometimes you'll see that I'll, I'll underline the things that God's doing and I'll italicize the things that we're to be doing and maybe I'll bold something that's a Jesus specific thing. Um, but in each week it's kind of a little different system. Um, and I might not always highlight that in the message time, but I do it because um, it helps me kind of organize my thinking.
thinking on that, and perhaps it helps you as you kind of look through it to, to draw connections into certain things. And, and try to say, well, right, what, what was Chaz thinking when he did these three phrases, all underlined and in bold? What is that supposed to represent? Um, because if I explained it all, I would be even more long-winded than typical. Um, but I, I, I just want to throw that out there. Um, and for like for this particular Sunday, uh, some text, some lines that are are highlighted, and, and typically they're not whole sentences; they're little fragments that link together. Uh, so that if you just look at underlying parts or just look at highlighted parts, you'll see little sub-themes connected. I'm sure that many of you caught on to that long ago, um, but perhaps some are just saying, I never could figure out what he's doing. Um, it's also an opportunity sometimes to, uh, if you open the worship packet, I actually send it out on time. If you open the worship packet prior to the service and read through the scripture, you might see some things to help... Um, Help you get spiritually in tune. Some things to reflect on uh, as we approach the scripture. And here, I want to point out, uh, this is why I'm doing this, that I chose to underline living stone. Um, and you'll notice that the underlined sections in this passage all kind of have to do with who Jesus is, the stone. Um, I also chose to bold stone. Um, because it's a key point of this passage, is this idea of stone. Earlier, if you were with us for our call to worship, we talked about Jesus being a rock, my rock, um, my, my place of refuge. And that idea of um, rock and, and foundation and stone, and we, we've talked recently about, about Peter, and Peter the rock, um, the rock on which Christ will build, build his church. And here, in Peter, he says, as you come to him, the living stone. So I underlined living, I bolded stone, because that's an emphasis. But I did not capitalize stone. That's how the editors of the New International Version, and that's where this text comes from, that's how they did it. And some of you have caught on, and again, different editors of different translations or versions of Scripture um, do little editorial cues, if you will. Many of us, I, I dare say, looking at here, most of us have grown up that if you were to write out the word God, that if you were talking about the Christian God, the Hebrew God, you would capitalize the G. But if you were writing about the Greek gods or a Roman God, you did not capitalize the G. That the capitalization was to give added emphasis and draw your attention to the specialness of that word. And so many biblical editors, when they put together a text and they're doing something that's referring to God and the different persons of the Trinity, different characteristics, will capitalize because they want you to understand this is being used as a title. So, in the NIV, stone here is capitalized. As you come to him, the living stone, God. Jesus is our stone. A living stone. Now, a living stone, not to be confused with Livingston, somebody's name, but a living stone. Stones don't live. I mean, that's kind of the nature of geology. Stones are not alive. They can't move. They can't change. They can't will themselves to do something. But as you come to him, the living stone, as you come to Jesus, the solid, sure foundation, he is a living being. He responds to circumstances out of his own free will. Now, now stone can respond to circumstances like erosion or gravity. Stone can respond to circumstances like you put wet sandstone in your fire pit and it explodes because of the, the heat. The stone doesn't choose to do those things. Jesus Christ, the living stone, 
deliberately chooses to be our rock, our refuge, our foundation. And so, it's just a little kind of behind the scenes on what's going on right there in that phrase with the living stone and why it's underlined and bolded and capitalized. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, and that recognition that there are a lot of people that do not see Jesus as any kind of living stone. They don't see him as something, something that has a, a, a will that's acting on our behalf. They've chosen to reject him. Maybe they've heard about him, maybe they've grown up with him, but maybe they feel they've grown away from him or they've grown up beyond him and now have set him aside. I mean, we recognize that that's a, a biblical concept. I mean, Paul talks about being childish and then being a man and putting away childish things. And there are some who have equated Jesus with childish things. Maybe because they grew up in a home where they went to Sunday school or vacation Bible school or they, were, they went to youth group or they went to, to, to summer camp. But now they're grown and they put those things behind them. And I think Paul would say, you know what? Maybe you've put the wrong things behind you. Maybe the things that you think are childish are the things that you most needed. Because maybe those things in, in your childhood were true or the deepest truths you could know. Jesus loves me, this I know. And maybe that's an early truth that you should not be putting aside. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans. And we recognize in this Easter season that there were folks who despised Jesus for what he was saying. They kind of put some time and effort into it. They, they, they recognized that he was not what they wanted. And they rejected him. Some rejected him passively, walked away. But we know with the Easter story that some rejected him violently. He must die. And some rejected him casually. Oh, we don't care one way or the other, but the crowd say, hey, yeah, let's get some excitement. Kill him, crucify him. Really not sure what we're talking about, but it means nothing to me. Give us some spectacle while we're in town. Rejected by humans, but chosen by God. What Jesus came to do was not by accident. He didn't fall in to this. This was part of God's plan. And that stone is precious to him, precious to God. As you come to him, that living stone, you also, like living stone, are being built into a spiritual house. Certainly the people today would understand about stones being made into a house. Um, the NIV actually here, and I, 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 I took it out uh, in my own editorializing. Uh, I took it out, there's a footnote in the NIV there, spiritual temple. Uh, and people certainly understand the idea of, of, of temple being built from stones. You're being built like built into a spiritual house. Like living stone. You are like living stones. You have a will in this. See, when a mason is building a home and he's got a pile of stones around, he's often trying to, or she, just to be fair, uh, is often trying to get just the right fit. And this stone with this stone next to it with this stone looks good, but this stone, oh, now it's wobbly. i got to pull this one out and put this one in. And the mason, the stone layer, the brick layer, is choosing those. The stones have nothing to do with it. They don't have a choice. And frankly, when they're done, there's probably going to be some stones that are rejected by the builder. That it just doesn't fit. I can't make it work. That one's too big, too wobbly, it has a slope, it has a slant. It just doesn't look good with the other ones. 
How many, has anybody here ever stacked a stone wall? I mean, not those modern paving blocks that you know, are common, perfectly dimensioned, but like field stone, you've tried to stack and make a wall. I've done that. And it is one of the most frustrating things. And I've taken down a wall that was in good shape because you had to put drains behind it and put it back and try to put it back in the exact same order, even lay them out as I did on the carport and then put them back in the, and it doesn't go back the same. It's an art to doing that, but the stones have nothing to say about it. And if the stone worker wants to take a mason's hammer and chisel off a corner or break off a, a section, the stone has no choice in it. But you're like living stones and you're being built into a spiritual home, a temple. You have some say in the matter. You offer yourself. And you recognize that sometimes this is a better fit if I develop in this area. And, and let's face it, most stone can't choose to grow. And I, I'm, I'm going to assume that most stone workers can't choose to make a stone bigger. They can make them smaller. But we, as we're being built up, we have the opportunity to choose to enlarge in certain areas. To increase in this area, to make the best fit, to be most useful in that spiritual house, that spiritual temple. Like living stones are being built in a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Stones are priests. Now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But this idea that in the living stone, who is our great high priest, that we, like living stones, are being built into the spiritual house and a holy priesthood. It's just using two images to try to explain the depth of what's going on here. We become a holy priesthood, consecrated, set apart, sanctified, sacred, chosen to be a priesthood, to connect people to God, to connect daily life to a faith life. We are called to be part of that. And we have free will in that. We are living stone. We work at that. Offering spiritual sacrifices. One of the things that priests do is to offer the sacrifices we bring every day in our lives. Spiritual sacrifice. In, in trying to follow after our living stone, we give from who we are. We say, well, Lord, use me for this. Or, or Lord, Keep me from this. Maybe, maybe we do need to build up a little bit of stone in this area. We need, need to chisel off some chunks in that area. And this becomes our spiritual sacrifice. A willingness to say, this is yours. Do with it as you will. And that sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. There's a lot to unpack in just that one sentence, and I encourage you to you know, maybe hang on to your worship packet or, or make sure that when you get home, you, you open whatever translation of the Bible you use and, and dive into that a little bit more. That's one sentence over two verses, and it's a lot in it. But it's about who we are in Jesus. And then Peter goes and he uses some texts that are, are from Hebrew Scripture, from the Old Testament as we would identify it. And he makes this connection to support his case on who Jesus is and that God has always planned for there to be this stone. That this rock could be part of our foundation. Verse 6. For in Scripture, it says, and I'm going to tell you, when, when you get to the end of Scripture, you'll see that there's um, a little bit of super text, uh, and it's a little smaller type. Um, that's where in the NIV, if you're, or if you're reading from your, your own NIV, or if you pull it up on a phone and you're looking at it, um, you would see a footnote. Um, here, the first one in verse 6, uh, I think would be footnote B. Uh, instead of having you have to look down for the final footnote, I actually put in there that B would direct you that that verse comes from Isaiah 28, verse 16. Um, again, Peter, when he said that, he didn't identify where it came from. That's editors along the way saying, hey, he's quoting scripture. Let's make it easy for you to find what scripture that is. We'll identify it right here by using a footnote. 
Again, just trying to give you some understanding of, of why I do what, what I've done in here. Uh, I'm not guaranteeing that it's, it's the right way, but it's the way that makes sense to me at that moment. It might be different next week, but at that moment, that's what makes sense. For in verse 6, for in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Said in the prophecy of Isaiah, and Peter says, you know what stone he was really talking about? He was really talking about Jesus. That God is placing a stone, chosen and precious cornerstone. Not an accidental stone. Not, hey, we've got this stone, why don't we build something around it? Not a philosophy or a cult or a learning environment that kind of, hey, Jesus said some good stuff, wouldn't that be something good to build on? But the, the master builder chose early on that this is going to be the stone that sets the whole building right. It's going to be the foundation stone. It's going to, it's going to set our angles. It's, it's going to it's the most important one we can put in here. We're going to start right so that we end right. I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. Very deliberate. This isn't an accident. God planned it this way so that when we come along, we can be living stones building on that same foundation. The verse continues, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. When we build off of the cornerstone, we say that's the accurate, that's the marker, that's what we're going to go from. We will never be put to shame. We will not be mistaken. We won't be found wrong. And we can, with confidence, say, I'm being placed where I need to be. You might sometimes say, well, you know what, in my faith walk, I sometimes have felt like I'm not where I should be. Well, the reference is, look back at the cornerstone. Are you in line with the cornerstone? And let's be honest, sometimes we have not been. I mentioned uh, rebuilding a stone wall. The house I grew up in, where my folks still live, uh, there's a, a concrete pad that leads into the garage, and we've always just called that the carport, uh, even though sometimes a carport has a, a roof over it, cars and everything. It's a concrete slab, nice parking space. And on either side, blue stone stacked walls. And the pressure of the dirt behind those water that would build up in there, freeze and thaw would shift those stones and they would bulge and they would tilt. And every now and then they had to be taken down and restacked. Every now and then you had to kind of look down the line and see how straight it is. Sometimes we have felt like we're not where we belong. That our spiritual life is a little off, off kilter, that we're, we're kind of hanging in a precarious situation. Well, we're living stones. We get to address that ourselves. We get to kind of look down that line. Draw our mason string and cross the face and say, do we line up with that cornerstone? As we build up, drop down that plumb line. Are we still plumb? And we get to make some adjustments and we'll never be put to shame when we trust that cornerstone. Peter goes on to talk a little bit more about that stone. He says, he says you know, stone can be a couple of different things. Verse 7, now you who believe. Very important. You who believe. You who have chosen to understand who this Jesus is, and you believe in him and put your trust in him so that you'll never be put to shame. To you who believe, this stone is precious. It's important. It's vital. We could not do without it. 
If you believe, you understand that. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. If you don't believe it, you're like the builder who rejects it. And it gets used somewhere else. Some other builder puts it in place. And it's worthless to you now because it's in that building. So if you believe, you understand, and you build off that, but if you rejected it, it does nothing for you anymore. The stone is still good. The stone is still valid. But you made a choice about that. And, oh, and that came from Psalm 118. And Peter says, and it's also like this, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. See, some can see that stone as precious and choose it to be the cornerstone, and others reject it. It's in the rejection pile, and they walk back to take a look at what they have been building, and they trip over it. They stumble over it. It gets in the way. It's an obstacle. Some have rejected who Jesus can be and who he would want them to be and how he would want to add them to part of that spiritual house. And they said, no, 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 I'm going to build this way. And in the meantime, stumble over that and trip over it. And it is something to be scorned. And there are people that you know that will mock your faith. There are people that you know that have walked away from faith and they want to get rid of that. They want to go tumble it down a hill into the weeds and let let vines overgrow it because it's messing up everything else. They want to get rid of it. They continue to reject that stone. The stone is the same. Jesus is the same. He's faithful and true. What makes a difference is our attitude towards him. Whether we choose to believe or not. Whether we choose to accept or we choose to reject. God has given us the perfect precious, chosen cornerstone. And we decide how to handle it. That came from Isaiah chapter 8. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. They stumble because they disobey the message. And all those who disobey the message are destined to stumble over. You can either build with it or be tripped up by it. And that's really the choice. You cannot ignore it. You can't say, well, that stone has nothing to do with me. I set that aside and I'm done. It'll keep in the path. The other thing about that is it continues to give you a choice. You can reject it today and stumble over it tomorrow and on the next day say, you know what? I'm seeing that stone in a new light. What Jesus has to offer, I set that aside for a while. I didn't think it was what I wanted, but now I can come back to that. Because here's something about that stone. You roll it down the hill into the weeds and let the overgrowth come over it. It doesn't decompose like that stump that you threw down there, that log that just didn't fit right into your log pile, make your log pile tilt to you. Chuck that in the weeds and let it rot. That stone is still going to be there. You can still make that decision. To make that stone, make that Jesus your cornerstone. And build from that. Verse 9. But you... See, that's what verse 7 was, Now you who believe... But then it said, but to those who do not believe, that was um, 7b, if you will. But 9 says, but you, you believers, you to whom the stone is precious, you are a chosen people. Just like the stone was a chosen cornerstone, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. You see how it expands? From people to priesthood, the nation to special possession. What's interesting here is Peter is using some of the language that would be most familiar to people of a, of a, of a Jewish faith 
who had grown up with the understanding that the Hebrew people were the chosen people, God specially picked. And Peter's using that same language. They say, you might not be of any Jewish DNA. You might not be of any Hebrew culture. But God is choosing you. And if you build on this cornerstone, you are that chosen people. You are that royal priesthood. You might not have any connection to Aaron in any way. You may never have heard the stories of the patriarchs. You may never have heard of that faith, but you heard of Jesus. And now because of that, because you accept that I'm going to build on this rock, that this will be my cornerstone. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, an entire peoples consecrated to God, called to serve God, to serve others on behalf of God, and to serve God to others. And you are God's special possession. God pulls you close and treasures you because you've chosen not to reject that stone. That others have stumbled over. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's who you are. Regardless of your faith background, regardless of your parentage, of your genetics, regardless of what you did yesterday, regardless of, of how many times you sinned against God, how many times you thumbed your nose at him. He was always there, always waiting to catch you, always waiting to say, stop stumbling over me and build upon me. And now you know that and you can declare the praise of the one who called you out, the one who said, I was there the whole time, the one who said, stop doing that, come into the light. You have been built on that stone. There's a song from the 80s, Starship, sang it. Now, and, and some of you are of the right era, that, that uh, you, you remember Jefferson Airplane, that then became Jefferson Starship, that then became just Starship, kind of like John Cougar Mellencamp, and you can kind of pick where in his career he was by how he's listed on the, on the label on that 45 you have, whether it was... John Cougar, John Cougar, John Mellencamp, John Cougar Mellencamp. Starship, the first album they had came out in 1985. And a song on there, We Built This City. For some of you, that's in your wheelhouse that comes on the radio and you start singing along. Even when it's kind of nonsense, you sing along. There's a line in there, Marconi plays the mama. I beg you to tell me what that's supposed to mean. I think it's just had some consonants and vowels that made a nice little rhyme scheme kind of feel, and they put it in a, a clear because the song's really about we built this city. And, and what did they build the city on? Rock and roll. We built this city on rock and roll. And it's really about this idea of hey, all the clubs where we used to go and hear live music, and, and we built this. This kind of community based on that rock music, that expression, that, that, that freedom that was in there. And now, they're, 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 they want to tear down the stone pony or something. They want to, they want to remove our favorite venue. And they're, they're going to put in a, a quick check over there. We built this city on rock and roll. And the corporate folks are coming in. And there's some language in that song about the corporate type taken away and you don't recognize us and we don't fit your, your view of, of, of who you want in the neighborhood anymore. But we built this city on rock and roll. Marconi plays the mama. Now wait, Marconi has got it. You call it the father of the radio. And you're talking about going to live venues. What does the radio have to do with it? It's, it's, a, weird, it's a weird song. It's, that, it's actually ended up on a bunch of worst songs ever of the rock era. Uh, but in its time, it was number one on the Billboard Hot 100. 
We built this city. We built the city on rock and roll. Built this city. We built the city on rock and roll. Say you don't know me or recognize my face. I don't. I don't fit in with who you think should be here. Say you don't care who goes to that kind of place. The people who go to those rock and roll joints aren't the kind of people that we care about anyway. They probably don't have a whole lot of money. They probably can't spend the way we want them to spend. They're not going to pay the rents that we want them to pay, so let's displace them. Knee Deep in the Hoopla, that actually became the name of the album. Knee Deep in the Hoopla, sinking in your fight, too many runaways eating up the night. No, it's the strays that end up in places like that. Those runaways, the riffraff. And then Marconi plays the mama, listen to the radio, don't you remember, we built this city. Someone's always playing corporation games, who cares, they're always changing corporation names. We just want to dance here, someone stole the stage, they call us irresponsible, write us off the page. And so it's this protest song. Protest about this corporate culture that was written kind of to be a corporate hit on radio. A song about, hey, you're taking away our places to listen to live music, but... We want that song to make, make us money. As some people, that's when they kind of gave up on Grace Slick. They gave up on Starship because they're not kind of the, the radical fringe protest. Hey, listen, people, they're not. How can we make the most money out of this situation? We built this city on rock and roll. And there's a certain generation that's kind of like, oh, yes, that's our, our angst, our, our stick to the man, our our give us back our music kind of thing. We built this city on rock and roll. Peter's telling you, no, no, no. You're being built up into a people, a city, a nation. A special chosen possession. And it's not on rock and roll. And it's not on tradition. And it's not on the law of Moses. And it's not on the word of the rabbis passed down through generations. It's not built on philosophy. It's not built on nationalism. It's built on one thing and one thing only. We built this. As living stones, we built ourselves into this on that cornerstone of who Jesus is. And Peter says this. And you can tell I thought, if you looked at the, the worship pack, you can tell I thought this was an important line for us to hear. Once... You were not a people, but now you are the people of God. When you make a decision about that cornerstone, when you say, I'm not going to build on rock and roll, I'm not going to build on, on, on popularity, I'm not going to build on finance, I'm not going to build on a political system, I'm not going to build on a philosophy, I'm going to build on Jesus I'm going to build on the living stone. I'm going to be part of that. Now, you are the people of God. It's about us deliberately choosing who we want to be, how we want to be used. What will we give ourselves to? And he concludes with, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. How do you get to be the chosen people of God? You accept the mercy that Jesus offers. You know that you've sinned. You know that you've stumbled over the truth. You know that you've kind of kicked it out of the way. You've rejected it. But God continues to be there waiting to catch us waiting for us to turn to him and say, yes, I want to be trued up with that stone. And now we have his mercy and we can be part of the people of God. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate communion. And it's a reminder that God knows our rejection. God knows our disobedience. God knows our rebellion and stayed with us and said, you know, I've got a plan. I've got a plan to rebuild all these folks into my people. And it's going to start with Jesus. But somebody's got to pay a price. And Jesus paid our price. 
So there's nothing that we have to do other than to accept Him. As you come to Him, the living stone, that's verse 4. Verse 7, now to you who believe. In verse 9, you are a chosen people. Verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And we see that because of this. <clears throat> because Jesus loved us and wanted us to be part of that spiritual house, that spiritual temple, wanted, wanted us to be part of his priesthood, his nation, wanted us to be part of God's special possession. Jesus died for us. And so we commemorate, we remember, we come back. We come back to the bread and to the cup. And we come back to how they remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus so that we could be built true. Not on rock and roll, but on the rock Jesus Christ. He gathered with his friends to celebrate the Passover. And he took from the table the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance. And he took a cup of wine and said, my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance. stone. Some reject it, but some choose to build on it. Some choose to allow him to be the rock of our refuge. Some choose to stand on those promises, to stand on that solid foundation and others stumble over. Choose for yourself. Will you build on or you roll them down over the hill into the weeds. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us in spite of us. Thank you to that stone that we've moved here and there and pushed out of our way because of we saw it as an inconvenience. We saw it as a, a stumbling stone. We saw it as something to, to bang our shins against in the dark. Thank you that in your light we were able to see it. Recognize it for what it was. Understand it to be a chosen and precious cornerstone and to build our lives from it. We thank you that you have called each one of us as, as the stones of the spiritual house to be built together that we could serve your purposes, that we could proclaim your praise, that we could let others know of the light that shines in the darkness. We thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and how it has changed our lives. And through him, we have become your people. We ask that you allow us to live our lives as a holy nation, as a royal priesthood, as those proclaiming the good news and offer, offering the sacrifices of faith. This is our prayer today. In the name of Jesus, our rock. Amen. Our hymn, The Church's One Foundation, it's uh, in the hymn.
number 668. If you're using the hymnal, we're only singing the first three verses. Uh, if you're using the worship packet, we'll just sing the three verses as they're printed there. Uh, the church's one foundation. I invite you to be careful to stand as we sing.